the, if, you, if you look at the title, the piece that I intend to focus on is the practitioner's perspective. Um, I have spent some time in academia, I was a senior research fellow at King's College, uh, on the Conflict Security and Development Group, which I think was the first academic grouping that actually looked at this um, cyclical relationship. But what I want to do is start from, if you like, almost the beginning of my career, and take you to where I am now, because what I am doing right now, I think, is, is very pertinent to what is, you are studying. Um, I've spent the last two years um, working as a, a UNDP advisor to the National Security Council in Baghdad, and I have been working to advise and assist them develop a new post-US national security strategy. So that is effectively taken two years, and there is now a draft in place that we hope will be um, publicized um, as the first policy statement of the new government after the upcoming elections in April. Having had two years working at the national level, I'm now advising and assisting the governor of Basra and the security committee in Basra to develop a security strategy for the government of, of Basra, for the province, if you like, that will nestle within the broader national security strategy. And we hope, we certainly hope in Baghdad, that I can help the security committee of Basra to develop um, guidelines, if you like. I hate to use the word template or model, because whatever we develop will be context-specific, but something which the central federal government can then roll out to the, um, to the other governments. So we can take the national security strategy and then roll that out through the country. Because the national security strategy is essentially a policy statement. But then to come down one more level means that we are then developing something more practical. So that's what I'm doing right now. I came to home on Friday. Um, Sorry, I'll get checked back. Flew home on Tuesday, and I go back on Sunday to continue with this work. <coughs> but Eleanor asked me to talk about holistic security, and that's really what I want to do. But I want to trace where I started from and how I have got to where I am, because if you think about security in a practical sense, you cannot get a bigger picture than the national security strategy, and you cannot get a more complex and difficult context in which to develop a national security strategy than Iraq. If you want to argue Afghanistan is more complex, then I'm quite happy to debate that because I spent, before Iraq, I spent two years in the Arab Palace with um, President Karzai. He's the only international security advisor there, but I will go through that in the course of my, my talk. Um, I actually joined the army in 1967 and my first operational deployment was in 1970 which was to Malaya as part of the 3 Commando Brigade Royal Marines um, so my initial military education was given to me by senior NCOs who had been engaged in the sort of drawdown from empire in places like Brunei and Malaya, Borneo, Aden so Rather than my initial guru, if you like, being Clausewitz and war colleges, my initial guru really was Sir Robert Thompson. Um, and what my education was all predicated on was the specific and targeted use of force supported by hearts and minds. Hearts and minds, as you all know, being an extremely ex inclusive construct of all sorts of social and economic and civil development. So I want to go through some of the key lessons from Malaya, Dofa, and this sort of tranche here to where I am at, at now, um, doing the Iraqi security strategy. But what I'm now waiting for is um, if a guy called Zalmay Rasul wins the election in Afghanistan. He was the national security advisor when I was there. Before last, he's already asked me that if he wins the election, if I would go back and act as an advisor once again to help them develop an Afghan national security policy. <coughs> so 
So what I'm going to basically argue is that from my perspective of, as a practitioner, apart from that intellectual void of the GWAT, when all of the lessons that we had learned up to that point seem to me to be thrown out the window. And then, of course, we then got to the David Petraeus and the sort of reorientation of the military from GWAT to counterinsurgency. We then sort of got back on track and we had to relearn many of the old lessons. But in my belief, by then it was probably too late in Afghanistan and Iraq. We had made so many gross mistakes strategic errors, that it was too late really to rescue the situation. We've had to depart from both countries with our tails between our legs. So for those who are not familiar with counterinsurgency doctrine, just, just have a quick look at that. Okay, so this was 1966, this was Malaya. So I come from that military culture, not the NATO war fighting, you know, huge tank battles um, in Western Europe. There is, there is a strand of us who were brought up on counterinsurgency. And I think you can see there that that's a pretty holistic approach to take to the generations, to the development of generation security. <laughs> The first time I was shot at was in a place called Dofar, which is a southern state of Oman, and this was, there was a campaign there, 1970 to 75, it was special forces, it was an attempt by communist terrorists operating out of Yemen, had the aim to destabilise Salt and Kaboos. It was a very small but hugely successful counterinsurgency campaign. Some quotes from Tony Jeeps, who was the SAS commander at the time that I was there, persuade them to join the government side. It was first and last a war about people, a war in which both sides winning the support of civilians. Military action was merely a means to an end. Two things were clear. First, that the answer to the insurgency lay in civil development. Second, that the answer had to be found by the Omanis themselves. Now, if you now think to what you've just heard from Malcolm, then of course this is, um, there is a resonance with what he was saying, albeit you know, using historical examples. It has, the answers have to be generated by the indigenous population themselves. We will, only, we will only make progress in Afghanistan when they produce their own Afghan solutions to Afghan problems. The interveners often cause more problems than they solve. So the particular sort of tactical lessons which have strategic consequences, which I learned in Dofa, no collateral damage. When we came under fire from houses, buildings, villages, we were not allowed to return fire to those houses and buildings because we could not guarantee that we would not cause collateral damage. Now, the British Army takes its lead in terms of culture. In my view, from the American Army, it is all about force protection. It's all about not taking casualties. If you're out on patrol now in Afghanistan, you come under fire from a group of buildings, I can almost cope with the fact that if they were to take aim small arms fire at that building, but they don't. What they do now is drop a thousand pound bomb on it with the inevitable collateral damage, and that collateral damage then acts as a recruiting sergeant. So tactically, yes, they achieve their aim, which is force protection. Strategically, all they do is recruit more terrorists, which makes the situation much more profoundly more difficult for those people to come after them. We also had to be able to sort of embed ourselves in the local culture, we didn't return to camp at night. We used to stay out with the local villages. Every one of our patrols had somebody who was trained in veterinary who could, who could sort of inject cattle. Cattle being the prime agricultural product there. Lives were based on cattle. It was hugely significant. <clears throat> and then when we actually caught people, there was no mention of surrender. We were 
taking them away from people who were trying to mislead them in the wrong direction. We treated all prisoners with honour. And consequently, many of those prisoners then turned and fought for us back against their own people. <coughs> Just put those lessons into the context of Abu Ghraib, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, how we conduct business now. So I then moved on, I did six years in Northern Ireland um, with all sorts of special forces, undercover type stuff. But what I did learn then was the importance of impartiality, restraint, and the need for a coordinated plan to get the two communities to work together. And of course, that had to be overlaid on all sorts of economic and social support um, in terms of building some form of political peace process. And I learned perhaps one of the biggest lessons that I've ever had to learn there, which when I was a, a young guy doing special forces, Martin McGuinness, who you now all probably have heard of, um, was one of my principal targets for arrest, apprehension. <laughs> a few years after that, I ended up providing protection to Martin McGuinness as part of the peace process. A few years after that, I ended up coming my forelock and calling the minister. And then I ended up sitting on a reconciliation panel with him um, and I got him out to Iraq when I was doing reconciliation there to help me explain the sacrifices individuals have to make in terms of taking a peace process forward. I mean, in my heart, I wanted to strangle the bugger, but my brain told me that I actually had to work with him. And I sat with Martin again, so I said, when did you cease, when did you become political? He said, well, I got the first mortgage. <laughs> and it was such a profound statement. I thought it was a bit, um, bit, bit like me, really. Um, so anyway, some of the sort of tactical lessons from Northern Ireland, which then helped to shape much of the subsequent things that I've done. <coughs> In um, 1994, the British Army set up a new organisation called Headquarters Doctrine and Training, and I've been banging on about how pathetically and badly we were doing, and we had Cold War doctrine, um, which was inappropriate for the challenges that we were facing at that time, principally in places like Bosnia, first and foremost, but also other people were struggling with Somalia, etc. We tried to take existing um, Nordic peacekeeping doctrine, um, upgrade it, if you like, so it was appropriate for the more volatile um, intra-state civil war type circumstances in which we found ourselves. We had a number of drafts. The first one was called, for those people who may, may know this, called Beyond Peacekeeping, then Wider Peacekeeping. And when Wider Peacekeeping was published, I slipped the word interim on the front cover because I was still not comfortable with it and I wanted to change it. And at that stage, it was my, I was leaving the little department to do lessons learned and write the doctrine. Um, so I then started to use the term peace support operations. And I used that term specifically to demonstrate that military activities were in support of the activities of other people and in support of peace. We achieved almost achieved consensus with the Americans and we ended up with a NATO manual. Um, but the Americans would not buy into the word peace support they wanted them to be called peace operations because they felt the military had primacy in intervention operations. But we and, you know, felt that the military were to create the conditions in which other people could address the underlying causes of the conflict and also to help others build the, the peace process that engender stability. So we called it peace support operations. Were they multifunctional? Of course they were. So are we treating Security holistically, were we trying to? Yes, of course we were. Um, multifunctional operations involving just about everybody else, all sorts of activities. And I think most significantly, in the definition of success for peace of order, designed to conclude by conciliation, if you like Malcolm's point again, it has to be an indigenous solution to the problem, and it's all about reconciliation, it's all about them building a political process that suits them, not one that we think we can impose upon them. So they're quotes from the Joint 
from the Joint Warfare publication. Now, <laughs> I just looked at that, and, and of course, I used to go, I produced this, um, it's in the manual, in 1999. I used to go and lecture at the Australian Warfare Centre on peace support operations on a regular basis. Malcolm's diagram is, I think, an upgraded plagiarism of my diagram. <laughs> um, <laughs> Which is great because you know we want we want to have a an international comprehensive holistic approach to this. Um, so if you think up here we've got the causes of conflict, it gets worse and worse. Over here we've got time pre-conflict when we're going to do conflict prevention. We've got the conflict, we've got post-conflict. And of course, what I was saying is you know looking at the various models, the development people are probably going to be in the country in which they're going to be trying you know, to sort of prevent conflict. Things get worse, emergency type A people involved, peacekeeping maybe, the, you know, a peace enforcement mission has to go in, peace enforcement being the effective use of force, but impartially. It's a policeman with a stick that's big enough to beat people up, um, rather than just a peacekeeper who can only use force in self-defense. Um, so, I stuck... So this was late 1999. I was working then as a research researcher at Chatham House, sorry, at King's College. We were just developing the concept and practice of securing sector reform at that stage. And that's when I met sort of Tony Wong. She was became one of the, the sort of practitioners at that stage. We had this brilliant group, and I love the intellectual discourse between academics, policymakers, and people like me. It was it was brilliant. Um, but we started to see the significance of engaging with the security sector to reform, although I never like the term because it's patronising the majority of them, when they would send me off to talk to people, I need to be able to do so on a one-to-one -one basis, not for them to think that I was coming in, but telling them that I was a super-duper sort of chap and knew more than they did. Um, so again, another example of how we were looking at security holistically, and again, um, as Malcolm was saying, you can see this line, this is 1990s PowerPoint. It was pretty avant-garde at the time. Um, but, you know, so we're going down various bits and we're transitioning, but there is always some form of engagement. S you know, stabilisation operations will continue. <coughs> but I did, I spent nearly two years in Rwanda doing security sector reform. Um, on behalf of King's College, because we were funded by Claire Short, who was very close to President Kagame at the time. So I was shuttled off there. Um, and I had, because of Claire Short's relationship with Kagame, I had absolute access to the President at all times and to the Chief of the Defence Staff. But what I found was it was completely, what was happening there was completely skewed by the international community. I went to a bar um, in Kigali to watch a rugby match, would you believe? And in the bar, I found two policemen. And I said, what are you chaps doing? They said, we're doing security sector reform. I said, who for? They said, Diffy. I said, which department? They said, oh, the regional desk. I was there for the minister. And I didn't know that there was other people from Diffy, but we were both working through the Diffy office in Kigali. <coughs> At the same time, UNDP was running a huge pro DDR program, you know, disbandment, disarmament, and reintegration program for the for the army, for the Rwandan Defence Force. While we were trying to recruit a load of policemen for the police force, so we had these disconnected, you know, no coordination, nobody knowing what's going on, and it was a complete screw up in many ways. So I then persuaded the the sort of higher leadership basically Kigami, that we need to do a security review, we need to do a comprehensive national, national threat assessment, we need to try and join all this up. Um, and that's when I got a whole gang from King's College out and did a comprehensive national threat assessment, and that was the first time I would engaged in the development of a national security sector reform security strategy. Because it was an attempt to try and coordinate the anarchic efforts of the international community. So that's really um, 
you can read all that. It's all in that. It's all in the paper that I've written. What you want, I gather, yes. Certainly the students, it's the war stories that came with it. Um, <coughs> so to go back before. <coughs> so having been doing this in Rwanda, I was then asked to go. Um, uh, sorry, I, I went to Kabul to write a paper to do an assessment of security sector reform on behalf of the Af Afghan Research and Evaluation Unit, a local NGO. I did my, wrote my paper, and three weeks later, four weeks later, I find myself working for the Foreign Office, employed in the ARG Palace, um, advising the National Security Advisor on the conduct of all those things that I've been promoting, the conduct of a comprehensive national security review to develop a national security strategy. Um, and that was an incredibly privileged position um, to go into the Isle of Paris every day. Um, it did mean that I got poked in the chest on a regular basis because whenever the international community screwed up on somebody or something, I was the nearest person and I would get beaten up regularly. But my principal colleague, the National Security Advisor, Zalmar Rasul, is now running hard um, in the elections to be president. If he's president, he's saying to come back and work for me again. Um, so, you know, what I'm saying is I've taken security, PSO became security sector reform, then tried to join up security sector reform in Rwanda, came up with these broader concepts of, of you know, doing it nationally, then end up in um, Kabul doing it. What we did in Kabul, first of all, was to try and set up a process to develop a national security strategy. So there was already a National Security Council. So I was plugged in one below that. We set up a Security Sector Reform Coordinating Committee, and we set up a Security Coordinating Committee. Here, Security Sector Reform, five pillars. Um, the Americans working with the army, the Germans the police, the Italians the justice sector, the Brits counter narcotics, the UN DDR. Complete, complete chaos. So we tried to form a committee to bring them all together to coordinate it, and these committees will be chaired by President Carter. It just didn't work. The Italians, for example, doing justice sector, they had two ambassadors, one doing justice and the other the regular ambassador. They, wouldn't, they hated one another so much they wouldn't even sit at the same table together. But whatever we try to do by way of coordination, the international community continues always refer back to national capitals in the direction. They were responding to the requirements of their own political leadership and the following day's newspapers, it seemed to me, rather than to take the operation forward. So we ended up, so that's the security, that was a nightmare. This one over here, we had two campaign, military campaign plans, both three-star generals, one doing peacekeeping and the other one doing the GWAT, and to try and get those two to coordinate, forget it. Okay, two generals, both thrusting to improve you know, their career development. To coordinate, they're almost impossible. I was beaten up regularly. Because from you know Karzai and the palace's perspective, the international community was anarchic. They just did their own thing. <coughs> right. Um, we produced a national security policy for Afghanistan. It was presented by President Karzai to the international community at the Serena Hotel in February 2006. The paper the policy paper was written in three parts, part one, part two, it's the classic ends ways, means, equation, um, part one was the vision, part two was what we wanted to get to, and then we had the two strategies, one for security sector reform, one for security, they had to be coordinated of course, so as you built capacity in the Afghan army or police, they could take on more responsibility, hopefully they would be able to get on top of the security situation and you know, strategic direction. But there were two initiatives going on at that stage that we were trying to coordinate from the palace. One was the development of the Afghan National Development Strategy. That was the bigger, that was, you know, that was in support of the UN Millennium Development Goals. That was the big picture. And within the Afghan National Development Strategy, one chapter was security. 
that chapter of the Afghan National Development Strategy on security set the context, the architecture, if you like, for this. So there was coordination. So this was designed to support the Afghan National Development Strategy. So we were looking at security holistically. This was a profoundly political document, and it was completely subverted by the international community. You had no wish to see this go because it did not suit their purposes, and they were, at that stage, only interested in the GWAT. The Afghans were way ahead of the international community, but the international community was not interested. Um, Karzai presented that and gave everybody that as a flyer at the meeting so they could conceptually perceive how simple was the construct of the national security policy. They were the chapters in the, um, and you, were, you can see we were clearly looking um, across the board. If you look bottom, good relations with neighbours, foreign policy, economic development, strategic governance, drugs, SSR. You know, we were trying to chuck in as much as we possibly could. Right, now, moving on <laughs> swiftly um, to Iraq. My first deployment to Iraq was with the UN. I've been there a few times before. was to develop a DDR program for the militias in Iraq around which all other UN programs could be focused. And this was a diagram I came up with in the executive summary of the paper that I produced. If, if you like, this is where we're trying to get to, again, very esoteric millennium development goals, social economic development policy, rule of law, states, sustainable. Um, so we had upstream activities being conducted by the UN. They all needed to be focused through the government of Iraq. And then we had all of these downstream activities all these funny acronyms, so various job creation and poverty alleviation programs. So in one conceptual picture and in one paper, one strategic plan for the UN, I tried to tie it all together. Um, it went absolutely nowhere because the UN agencies, for those who worked with the UN, will know UN agencies are as parochial and will bitterly fight any and every other UN agency when it comes to competition for resources. They are uh, as again to coordination as, as anybody else seems to be, as far as I've seen. Um, but there's much more describing that in the paper that I've, that I've produced. So I went from um, doing reconciliation, uh, DDR, I was DDR advisor, then reconciliation advisor, then I made chums with the Deputy National Security Advisor, Dr. Safar Saul, who is now a good friend, and the Chief Civil Servant, and we came up with, for those people, a process for policy development. Um, it is holistic, it is comprehensive, we try and touch on all sorts of stuff, and I don't have time to go through it. But, you know, this was something that we, based on my previous experience, and in a process of workshops, um, one in Istanbul, and I managed to run one at Chatham House and one at Bath University, where I brought principal senior Iraqis to the UK. We sat down with some UK academics, Professor Paul Cornish and others, and we tried to come up with a process that we could use in Iraq for the development of their... And we came up with all these steps, and God bless them, this is just brilliant. I, I've got just two more slides. But the Iraqis, these really bright, clever technocrats with whom I've been working so far as all of the Deputy National Security Advisor, a guy called Hamza Hassan Sheriff, they then came up with their process, how they wanted to take that formulaic um, agreement. What they decided to do is establish a steering committee working to the National Security Council. Under that, we have established in back now and it's called the Nahrain Center for Strategic Studies. That is a quasi-official um, academic organization, which is at the core of the national security review that we've been doing. Through the center, we've tasked all sorts of government agencies and security forces. Sorry, this is 
screwing that up. Isn't it? <laughs> We've tasked a whole number of government agencies to do various elements of the review that we want to be conducted. Again, you'll see it's extremely comprehensive. But also, we've tasked a load of civil society organisations, think tanks and universities in Baghdad. And what we are doing now, what we have been doing, is synergising the response to the questionnaires that we pose left and right. So we get an independent, two independent views, which we can now do synthesise together, present to the steering committee for decision, yes or no in the National Security Council. That was an entirely Iraqi construct, and I think it's brilliant. I'm absolutely thrilled when they came up with this bit. So it wasn't just government, it was civil society, the universities, the think tanks. We should not underestimate the people that we work with. That's a brilliant model. I will take that back to Afghanistan, if that's where I go next. Anyway, we also came up with a series of guidelines, timelines, based on the elections, which are next month. <coughs> so just some final lessons. Um, if you ever think you're coming close to getting an answer, you're not. What does holistic mean? Don't ask me. It means multi-everything. Um, and if you ever think you... You know, it's the Rumsfeld, the uncertainties that we don't even haven't even identified. We don't know what's going to happen. I was talk yesterday, publicised today in the I just know the front page of the Telegraph by the um, chief of the defence, chief of the chief of the general staff, Peter Wall, um, and he's going to go crazy because it was Chatham House rules. It was at Chatham House. It's all over the newspaper today. But basically, he was saying, who could have predicted what's happened in Ukraine you know, a year ago? You know, there suddenly is, they're talking about, oh, we need, the, we need the ability to conduct conventional war again. Well, we haven't got it. Um, so, you know, the over-the-horizon scanning piece, it's a good exercise to go through. But, you know, we never know what's out there. And when we talk about holistic security, be as open-minded as you possibly can. Be as comprehensive, be multi-everything you can think of across the board, horizontally, vertically. You know, it, it's a huge picture um, that you need to draw together. Um, so that's all I want to say. I've written quite a comprehensive paper to go with it. But what I would like to think that I'm doing is providing the students, um, rather than the crusty old practitioners in the room, um, with some um, models that they can perhaps refer to, or the beauty of being a panel expert is you know, we are open to provide the students with advice if there is anything that you wish to know. And if you find yourself stuck in the field, somebody will have had something like that problem before in the past, so you can always ask us for advice. Thank you. Thank you very much.